Okay, hello everyone. We'll officially start the webinar. Thank you everyone for attending this forum. To our distinguished panel of speakers, to our official media partner, the Manila Times, to other media friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar on China-Philippines Maritime Economic Cooperation. My name is Anna Malindugui and I am one of the coach, I'm one of the chair chairs or moderators of this forum. Mr. Daifan, Director for Philippine Studies in Henan University will be my co-chair and co-moderator of this forum. Before I proceed, I would like to let our friends attending this webinar to know that you can write your questions and comments in the Zoom chat box and we will try to accommodate them as much as we can during the open forum. Also, before I proceed, let me give the floor to my co-chair and co-moderator, Mr. Daifan, to express his greetings to all participants who are attending this webinar via Zoom. And our friends also attending the webinar via different social media platforms like Facebook, like Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Mr. Daipan, you have the floor. Oh, I, I should speak something? Yeah, just to greet our friends. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so sorry, it's very, it's very bad to see so many old friends and uh, it's better during COVID-19 COVID time. So, uh, it's, it, so I think it's um, it's been important for our other friend to promote our friendship for, uh, especially when President uh, Marcos took in power since uh, two months ago. I think it's a good time for us to try to explore how to promote our future cooperation. So, um, so this one this time we invite some scholars both from the Philippines and China and. Uh, and get together to try to some uh, cooperation, especially on maritime and a facial cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, my co-moderator and chair, Mr. Daipan. Ladies and gentlemen, just to inform everyone, this webinar is organized and co-sponsored by the Global Governance Institution, or GGI, Asian Century Philippine Strategic Studies Institute, Integrated Development Studies Institute, Global Talk Global Talk News Radio or GTNR, Phil Bricks, and again, the official media partner is the Manila Times. The basic rationale behind the conduct of this webinar is to explore and provide some inputs from experts both from the Philippines and China on the current status of bilateral cooperation between China and the Philippines in the fields of maritime environmental protection, maritime law enforcement cooperation, and maritime fisheries or fishery management and cooperation. Difficulties and challenges facing China-Philippine cooperation in these fields will be analyzed from the point of view of non-government organizations because all of the panel of speakers are representing different um, think tanks and NGOs. In addition, opinions mm -hmm. and suggestions for strengthening cooperation for both sides will be explored and discussed, including indicating both sides' positive attitude towards strengthening maritime cooperation and how such efforts can become an important platform for China and the Philippines to enhance dialogue, increase mutual trust, expand exchanges, and deepen cooperation so as to promote peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region. On this note, without further ado, to start with our program for this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Join me in welcoming the founder and president of the Global Governance Institution, or GGI, Captain Andy Tian, for the opening remarks. Captain Andy, you have the floor. Please proceed. Thank you, Anna, for your very kind words. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Herman uh, Kamantun Tulario, uh, president of Asian Central Philippines uh, Strategic Study Institute. Institute. Uh, Prophet Anna, without whom we could not have made it here, uh, distinguished speakers and audiences. Uh, on behalf of the Global Government Institution, a uh, warm welcome to you all. I'm retired Captain Andy Tian, founder and the president of the Global Government Institution. Under the series of China-Philippines dialogues at NGO level, uh, we are very proud that we have organized two online webinars, respectively, on overall sino philippines relations, and uh, the other is the Oil and Gas Joint Development Corporation which promoted uh, mutual understandings and trust between the two countries and two peoples. So we are uh, very proud of that. Today, we are going to focus on marine environment protection, fishery management, and maritime law enforcement cooperation. Those three areas are actually closely related to each other. 
Marine environment lays the foundation for sustainable development of marine economy, including fishery. Any pollution of the marine environment would become common catastrophe for both peoples whose prosperity rely much on marine resources. Fishery resources are essential, are essentials for all maritime states. However, the IUU fishing uh, destroys the potentials for people to make best use of these uh, food resources. Either protection of uh, maritime environments or fishery management needs a good maritime order that could be only achieved through robust maritime law enforcement. To achieve good governance in those three areas, reflect the demand for a fair balance between development and security. So what is the status quo of cooperation between the two countries in these three areas? Are there any difficulties and challenges in how to innovatively achieve the set balance between development and security in common maritime domain? To study and answer those questions, today we're honored to have with us a group of a great serious scholars. So without further delay, uh, please allow me to give back the floor to our two co-chairs uh, for this forum, Professor Anna and uh, Associate Professor Mr. Daifan. Anna, please the floor, I give the floor back to you. Thank you, Captain Andy Tian, founder and president of Global Governance um, Institution for that stimulating and motivating opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me introduce the first panel of speakers. Our first speaker is a major figure in fair and accurate reporting about the realities between the Philippines and China, as well as the global vision of China to build a better world for all peoples and nation. Mr. Herman Camintong Tu Laurel sustained this creed of fair writing on issues related to China for over two decades now. This, his advocacy for truth and fairness relative to the Philippine-China relation extended um, by his activities in broadcast, in writing, in different um, um, broadsheets, and also um, news um, media network, and also um, by his activities on radio and TV. Before he became a journalist and broadcaster, Mr. Laurel was appointed to several government posts in the past decades. He headed the Philippine government UNHCR, Philippine Refugee Processing Center project for several years, and he ran actually for senator in 1995. He is currently as the host of Ang Maestro, the, the Unfinished Revolution, broadcasters, broadcasted by Radio Pilipinas. He's also the host of an online podcast, Power Thinks, of the Global Talk News Radio. Um, it's being streamlined in various social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube. And one of the hosts of a television show, Opinion Ngayon, aired in Golden Nations Network or GNN every Friday. Mr. Laurel is also one of the 2021 Award for Promoting Philippine China Understanding as one of the awardees under the Outstanding Contributions category. Likewise, he is serving as the president of Asian Century Philippine Strategic Studies Institute. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Herman Chu Laurel for his opening statement or presentation. Kamento, you have yes. the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And uh, first of all, let me start by uh, uh, expressing my appreciation for the initiative taken by uh, retired Captain uh, Andy Shichen Kian Kian, founder and president of the Global Governance Institution, and to the institution for bringing together these uh, experts today uh, to gather information and knowledge uh, from the scholars of China and our scholars from the Philippines to discuss this primordial topic, cooperation on the protection of marine environment, fishery management and maritime law enforcement. And these issues truly should concern our two nations that are heavily reliant on all these three aspects of the South China Sea. Allow me to greet also our old friend, Professor Dai Fan, Director of, uh, for Philippine Studies of Jinan University, whom we have had very close and warm cooperative relations for many years in the past decade. Of course, also to our fellow panelists, starting with the very young scholars from China's various maritime research institutions, 
such as the Research Center for of Ocean Law and Policy, National Institute for South China Sea Studies, Director and da Dr. Yan Yan, South China Sea Fisheries Research Institute uh, of the Chinese Academy of Fisheries Sciences, Dr. Ming Jun Chao, and the Global Governance Institution Distinguished Fellow, uh, Dr. Zhu Suan. I mention all these because I also have to memorize all these names and all these institutions uh, as we are uh, going to focus on these maritime issues uh, in the coming months in our institution. Last but not least to my colleagues from the Philippines co-moderator of this event, uh, Professor Anna Malindogui and our eminent resource persons, Dr. Bobby Tuason of CENPEG and the, uh, the Association for Filipino China or Philippine China Understanding Laureate uh, in 2021, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Adolfo Kaado Paglinawan, who authored the latest book, the hit book uh, entitled, I need to mention this because it's very relevant to our region and our world, quoting the title, No Vaccine for a Virus Called Racism, unquote, uh, which has become very popular. Uh, as the uh, issues of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, has been very prominent. More than half of the fishing vessels in the world operate in the South China Sea, and that is a vital source of protein for many countries of Asia and ASEAN in particular. An estimated one-third of global shipping using the body of water serving all, uses the body of water serving all Asian and ASEAN countries and the rest of the world. Scientists have been warning that the sea may fast become the site of uh, environmental disasters and uh, threaten the collapse of one of the wo uh, world's most uh, productive fisheries. Sovereign rights and uh, such issues have been an object of uh, sovereign rights have been an object of contention among bordering countries. E experts uh, uh, that include geopolitical strategies as well as marine biologists is, is calling on the disputing parties to come together to manage and protect the seas, fish stocks and marine environment and peace and security. The security of these, uh, of these uh, vital waters of Asia are threatened by piracy, smuggling, natural disasters, but most of all, interference from external powers from 10,000 miles away, bringing their strategy of tension and a lot of disinformation on these issues which makes our Philippine-China and China-ASEAN dialogues on these issues even more important and timely. Effective management hinges on China's active participation, and we are very, I am personally very happy uh, the, to note that China has always taken to the forefront in the vital tasks of leading the way in all these three major fields of concerns that we are set to discuss today. Fishery management, protection of marine environment, and maritime law enforcement. At this point, let me express both my personal and my country's deep appreciation for China's initiative in imposing on China's fishing fleet an annual summer sea fishing moratorium in the decades past. It is an exercise of national and governmental self-discipline and ecological environmental economic wisdom that we in the Philippines have not yet formed that strong will to implement and to help protect the South China Sea environment and fisheries resources. Reflecting on our topics today, I am inclined to engage in self-criticism over my country's great deficiencies in these three concerns. The first I have discussed about, uh, we are not doing enough in fisheries conservation. In fact, just days before this webinar, I updated on the scourge of dynamite and cyanide fishing in our country, and the devastation from these damaging fishing practices continue with little abatement. In terms of the South China Sea security and other, and the ideals for peace and tranquility in the South China Sea amid sovereignty and sovereign rights issues, the Declaration of Conduct has had a long and successful journey towards near finalization in the Code of Conduct. The Philippines has had a fluctuating intensity in its support for the early consummation of the Code of Conduct, and this requires more domestic promotion in the country for popular appreciation and support. Philippine-China Coast Guard dialogues and agreements have steadily been advancing with the most uh, progress noted during the term of Philippine Coast Guard Chief Admiral Joel Garcia with the dialogues of the Joint Coast Guard Committee 
memorandum of understandings and terms of references on cooperation in the sectors of preventing and combating drug trafficking and other transnational crimes, uh, environment protection and emergency response through, among other modalities, information exchange and pragmatic empowerment activities unique for Coast Guard and enforcement agencies. The bilateral mechanism for dialogue between China and the Philippines has become very effective in reducing public controversies over incidents between various sea plying Filipino and Chinese sea vessels, as well as encounters of Philippine and Chinese security vessels. When the Philippine media reports such incidents, which are frequently spurious incidents just to create controversy, the Philippine authorities pass the issues on to the bilateral mechanism to thresh out and clarify. The multiplicity of maritime cooperation issues is immense, and a short webinar cannot be expected to cover all of them. The examples of progress in maritime cooperation between China and the Philippines described above are, a bit, are but some snippets of a broad array of past and ongoing activities along this line. But I will note as I conclude this short presentation, an observation that our late maritime expert and top diplomat, uh, Ambassador Alberto Encomienda observed that we in the Philippines, despite being an archipelagic nation, have too few thinkers devoted to maritime studies and visioning. The few maritime think tanks are mainly in the Philippines are mainly controlled by the West and used in stirring up controversies instead of genuine and sincere dedication to maritime productivity of the South China Sea and the region, environmental sustainability, and security of the region's vital seas and waterways. This is just a brief uh, start. I know some of my colleagues have uh, quite a considerable uh, presentation, so I will give them much more time. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, um, Kamentong, for that very um, enlightening um, opening remarks or opening statement on the topic. Um, from my side, what I can say is that Kamentong actually pointed out the different challenges uh, when it comes to maritime cooperation between China and the Philippines over the South China Sea precisely because of issues related to sovereignty and sovereign rights. And I also would like to point out that he emphasized the importance of the code of conduct of the South China Sea when we talk about how you know, we can possibly um, respond to the different challenges um, between the two countries and other also claimant states in the South China Sea. And also the importance, he also emphasized the importance of the um, bilateral dialogue in resolving common issues between the Philippines and China. And, and I think this should be um, intensified. I mean, the dialogue between the two countries and the different mechanisms. So I think those are my takeaways from Kamenton's presentation. Um, Mr. Daifan, the floor is yours. Hi. Sorry, I should give some comments. Yes, if you have. And um, also the introduction of the second speaker. Uh, okay, so maybe I will give. Uh, okay, okay, so, oh, oh, sorry. So, so, I'm so, so, okay, so, uh, so this, this speaker is uh, Dr. Yan Yan. Um, she's the director of Research uh, Center of Ocean Laws and Policy in National Institute for South China Sea. Studies and uh, I guess maybe many of our know Dr. Yan Yan is a very famous expert on maritime study and South China Sea study studies. So in the past few years, she ever attended many international conferences in different countries, also in China and uh, and the Philippines and Vietnam. So today she will uh, she will try to explore how to promote the maritime cooperation between China and the Philippines. And I believe we can benefit from her insightful analysis. Okay, Dr. Yan Yan, your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to uh, talk to my Manila friends once again. It's always a pleasure to uh, to uh, to uh, to see you. You know, even through the only through the virtual conference. Uh, may I sh first share my screen? Because uh, so, uh, thank you, everyone. I, I'm today. I'm going to touch upon a, a more a specific um, issue: the uh, China-Philippines maritime law enforcement cooperation in the South China Sea. As the organizers uh, give me this 
this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, as a topic as a uh, yes uh, to discuss. Well, uh, I would like to today first to talk about this uh, umbrella BCM, the uh, China Philippines Bilateral Consultative Conference mechanism, um, as um, a, a brief overview of this BCM, and then I'll touch upon um, to look back the uh, Coast Guard cooperation that we have been achieved um, so far and what are the opticals for the future cooperation. And then thirdly, I will uh, uh, I would like to uh, introduce another project that have been ongoing since the year 2015, initiated by an NGO HD Humanitarian Dialogue, and to see uh, whether this program can shed some light for the uh, China-Philippines cooperation in the future. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, um, first of all, the BCM meetings, I think everyone is here will be, uh, must be very familiar with this, uh, with this uh, mechanism. It was initiated by a President Duterte and, uh, and China, uh, in since the year 2016 to promote a peaceful management of conflicts in the South China Sea and try to strengthen friendly relations between um, Philippines and China. And so far uh, before the pandemic, um, there uh, we have conducted uh, five meetings and uh, also the sixth one is the virtual meeting in the year 2021. So this is, uh, this is the uh, umbrella uh, bilateral mechanism by the two sides, by the two governments, to uh, try and to uh, talk to about the uh, South China Sea issues, and also uh, to uh, more importantly to promote maritime cooperation, uh, pragmatic cooperation in in the in, in the sea. So um, I really wanted to mention the uh, the third meeting, which is the uh, uh, in the year two thousand eighteen, because um, uh, in the year two thousand eighteen they made a landmark decision. Uh, to uh, pursue actual cooperation on joint exploration and development of maritime uh, marine oil and gas. Um, and this decision eventually to the signing of the uh, MOU in year um, 2018 on the cooperation in oil and gas development uh, between China and the Philippines. But um, since the last conference um, has already been touched, has already touched upon this um, oil and gas exploration uh, topic, so I won't uh, give too much detail here. So, um, from the past six consultative meetings, the BCM, I think um, all we can see is that uh, the BCM has promoted pragmatic cooperation through the establishment of working groups and the steering meetings in order to uh, achieve uh, pragmatic uh, cooperation between the, the two countries. And uh, while it has improved so much under the Duterte administration, I think people uh, in the two countries are now waiting to see if this positive momentum can be sustained in the uh, new Marcos um, government. So, um, so far, the uh, I think the uh, the uh, new president Marcos has uh, has shown us his uh, friendly uh, policy and attitude towards China, towards the and he promises to usher a golden era in the China-Philippine relations. So I'm personally hoping that this uh, seventh BCM under this uh, Mark government will maybe at the end of this year. So uh, let's just keep an eye on that. Um, and second, I wanted to talk about the uh, how far we have gone from the first uh, China-Philippine Coast Guard cooperation uh, starts in the year 2016. Uh, this is uh, this is a, a very important MOU between the two Coast Guards um, on the establishment of a, of a joint coast on maritime cooperation since um, the year 2016. And since then, I think uh, the two Coast Guards have, under this framework, under the two cars have been conducted many uh, cooperative projects. For example, the visits, exchange visits, capability, uh, building and information exchange and training, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in the year 2017, I think the uh, we have a, a training course back in uh, back in uh, back in China, in Zhejiang uh, and the Philippines. Um, the uh, commander of the Philippine Coast Guard China, headed a delegation and I visited Xiamen. Mm -hmm. So in the year 20, Chinese Coast Guard for the first time uh, visited Manila and also conducted joint search and rescue exercises right before the uh, the whole pandemic uh, uh, broke out. Uh, 
So uh, I think that from the previous experience, although we have already have several um, cooperation projects with Coast Guard, so far the uh, the cooperation between the two countries is still at a very preliminary stage. I think that there is still room to improve. Uh, there's still room for improvement um, compared to other uh, uh, other maritime uh, law enforcement cooperations between China and other countries. So I'm, I'm still looking for a more pragmatic cooperation in the future. And third, I would like to introduce another program that has been uh, in, uh, conducted and initiated by the uh, an NGO, the uh, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, uh, uh, an NGO based in Switzerland, and since the year two thousand and fifteen, because they bring together uh, bring together technical experts and government officials, um, law enforcement agency of officers from five countries, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and conduct several uh, training courses and uh, exchange of views and tabletop scenarios and sim simulator training courses, et cetera, et cetera, to improve this um, confidence building uh, between these five countries. Um, since year 2005. I think they have already uh, come a long way uh, from uh, from uh, seven years ago. I was uh, I, I participated in the first conference back in Beijing um, uh, since 2015. I, and I do see achievements from this project. Uh, from the past years, the project have been conducted in Singapore, in Manila, in Kuala Lumpur, in Hanoi, and also in, uh, in Manila, uh, in Jakarta, uh, uh, for uh, the training courses and for the tabletop exercises, et cetera, et cetera. So I think personally think that this is a from the bottom up um, attempt to promote trust and uh, to try to understand each other uh, better in, uh, in in this project. And I think the biggest achievement is that they have uh, reached uh, a COP, the uh, the common operating principles under this under this uh, under this program, and it actually the COPs um, set a set of a baseline of operating principles that could help provide a reference point and guidance for the uh, maritime law enforcement agencies uh, uh, when they encounter each other at sea, and also between uh, law enforcement agencies and navies, and between law enforcement agencies, ships, and and, and, and fishing vessels. So I think it's the uh, a very nice, a uh, very good way to prevent incidents and to increase uh, predict predictability and reduce tensions. I think uh, this is uh, what we have ach have already achieved. Uh, the three principles that uh, serve as a baseline is the principle of transparency and communication, the principle of do not harm, the principle of uh, due regard for good and order, and all those principles are inspired by by the like, for example, cues of 2014, by the uh, inspired by the UN Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials of 1979, and also um, other uh, existing international conventions. So um, this this is the COPs that uh, the five countries participants have already uh, reached consensus. So uh, finally, the way forward, I think um, uh, to consider the. the Future operation should be an approach from the top down or or from the bottom up. I think both approach should be uh, should be conducted at the same time. Uh, from the bot from the top down, we need to see. We wanted to see uh, the continue BCM bilateral consultative mechanism in the Marcos uh, government. Um, the seventh uh, BCM conference. Uh, hopefully, it can be uh, conducted in the near future. And then from the bottom up. I think that we already see uh, Coast Guard official, officials working on the COPs for the past seven years, for the past uh, five, six years. So um, so I'm thinking that uh, with the help of the government um, and the uh, government officials from the bottom up um, attempts, we can uh, see a more pragmatic and uh, uh, cooperation between the two um, two um, law enforcement agencies in the future. So that's so much for today. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Yanya. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Yanya.
thus far for me, I think what is important in Dr. Yan Yan's um presentation that from my side I I I, I got no is first and foremost that the China Philippine bilateral consultative mechanism, especially over the South China Sea, is quite important and. We're saying that, you know, we hope that under the new administration, under the leadership of President Bongbong Marcos Jr., that we will see that the new, that the seventh BCM will happen by the end of the year. And hopefully we see that. And as we know, um, maintaining dialogue between the two sides is important in resolving whatever differences or, 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 things that needs to be talked about between the two sides over maritime security or environmental protection or even um, the issue of pursuing you know the oil and gas joint exploration in the south china sea between china and the philippines so these are things that i think um dr yanyan emphasized and i think we hope to see this happen in a matter of time so that's my takeaway um any thoughts or inputs from your side mr daipan before I introduce our third speaker. Okay, so totally, you know, um, uh, she looks back the cooperation, the like Coast Guard cooperation, and the uh, humanitarian dialogue in the past few years. And um, so she also um, indicated on the that kind of the future of our cooperation. So just as Professor Anna said, so hopefully our government uh, can promote our cooperation and uh, develop our maritime uh, cooperation during um, President Marco Jr. chance. Yes, I hope the same thing, and I hope to see more dialogue between the two sides on different issues. No, it's it's very important because through dialogue we will build more understanding. So, without further ado, let me introduce our third third speaker for today. So. Um, our third speaker for today was the former head of the Political Science Committee of the University of the Philippines, Manila. He is an investigative journalist, editor, and publisher of various newspapers and online publications. He has written more than 300 investigative reports and analysis and co-authored 10 books on political parties and electoral reform, governance and corruption, foreign policy and national security, international affairs and peace process. He is regularly invited as a resource expert in international fora, including in the United States, Europe and Asia. Once again, friends and colleagues, join me in welcoming the sec our third speaker of for this afternoon we, afternoon's webinar the director of policy the director for policy studies of the center for people empowerment and governance or CENPEG, professor bobby tuazan professor tuazan you have the floor sir thank you very much uh, professor Anna. so i will uh, i will deal mainly now on the uh, uh, on the various aspects and areas of uh, cooperation between the two countries and uh, uh, the, the period of the, that this will cover will begin in 2018, sometimes even in 2017. So first off, on November 20, uh, 2018, there was a memorandum of understanding and cooperation on oil and gas development between the Philippines or the government of the Republic of the Philippines and the government of PRC authorizing China's National Offshore Oil Corporation on the one hand, and the Philippine National Oil Company Exploration Corporation on the other, uh, with a pro pro provision that uh, this, uh, this uh, MOU on the joint uh, exploration uh, is without prejudice to the respective legal positions of both governments, uh, meaning to say, the different positions uh, of the taken by the official by the governments uh, with regard, for instance, the arbitral ruling of July 2016. Now, um, some people uh, would like to see this, however, as a framework. It is a framework, and as an MOU, not necessarily legally binding. Uh, and it was uh, one of the deals 
uh, that were signed of uh, among 29 agreements exchanged in the presence of President Duterte and President Z, uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, on May 22, 2021, uh, the uh, latest bilateral consultation mechanism was convened on uh, to discuss the South China Sea issues. I, uh, I, uh, I know that the uh, active uh, promoter of the uh, bilateral consultation mechanism uh, was uh, the Philippine ambassador to China, uh, Chito Santaromana. Uh, so he was behind all this uh, activity as far as the Philippines is concerned. But unfortunately, he passed away, I think, early this year. Uh, so uh, th this uh, raises the question whether how this or when this bilateral consultation mechanism will reconvene once again. Now, last July this year, uh, President Marcos Jr. and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi agreed to upgrade cooperation, uh, not only to continue cooperation, but also to upgrade resolve differences on the South China Sea through dialogue. On the other hand, uh, the president, the Philippine president reiterated the Philippines adherence to the one China principle, uh, which he also reiterated at the height of the Taiwan crisis uh, recently. And both also agreed that the South China Sea issue is not the sum total or the mainstream of both countries' relationship and should not be an obstacle to bilateral cooperation. During the third week of August, just recently, uh, both countries talk about maritime cooperation this time uh, by exploring hotline communication and legal affairs cooperation between the two countries' Coast Guards. I think this was mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Yan Yan. And both countries, uh, they also discuss both countries' capacity building for maritime governance, safety supervision, and vessel safety inspection, collaboration on maritime traffic safety and ferry safety, as well as MOU and maritime search and rescue efforts. Let me just uh, do note in addition that such cooperation talks have been ongoing despite the uh, uh, outbreak or occurrences of, uh, of uh, problems like allegations of uh, uh, Filipino fishermen being prohibited from fishing and so on and so forth, which I need not discuss in detail here. So the fishing, uh, fishing, uh, Fishing is a very contentious issue. It remains a very, a very contentious, uh, contentious issue. In fact, on June 3, last June 3, China rejected the Philippines' protest, diplomatic protest, over the fishing ban or, or moratorium uh, declared by China over areas that uh, supposedly extend to the West Philippine Sea in the South China Sea. And the moratorium was supposed to last from May 1 to August uh, 2022. Uh, the Chinese force explained that moratorium is a normal measure of protecting marine biological resources. Now, going beyond that, uh, fishing in the Philippines is really a major problem now. Uh, in the face of the fact that the fishing is a vital source of jobs and food security for the Philippines' 113 million population. Uh, take note that the Philippines is an archipelagic country of, uh, of uh, several thousands of islands, uh, and therefore it is uh, characterized by coastlines, making uh, many Filipino families and including uh, farmers to, uh, to engage in fishing. Uh, in, in fishing. Uh, the main problem facing the Philippines now is overfishing or steady decrease in production, which threatens, of course, the 
uh, food security, and it is also being depleted likewise by the effects of climate change. I note here, uh, therefore, uh, from this, uh, from this uh, situation, from these problems, a possible area of cooperation between the two countries, which is, uh, well, just to mention one, uh, a, a effective scientific management of fishing operations in the Philippines, uh, in which China has a lot of experience and expertise. However, despite the steady and consistent cooperation between the two countries, uh, such cooperation faces challenges uh, that, that tend to affect, if not properly handled, tend to affect uh, such cooperation. Uh, for most of these challenges, and it has come out recently with its Indo-Pacific containment strategy, uh, instrumentalized by uh, new formation, military formations, such as AUKUS, the Australia, UK, US uh, uh, cooperation uh, that is designed to uh, assist uh, Australia with its uh, nuclear submarine capability. And then there is the QUAD quad, uh, which also includes Japan and India. And uh, supposedly, this is uh, the Asian version of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And also the US, of course, is uh, maximizing uh, its defense alliance that include a defense alliance with the Philippines, not only the Philippines, but also Japan, South Korea, uh, and certain military, uh, of course, Australia and New Zealand, and some military cooperation agreements with other Southeast Asian countries. A major challenge also is uh, the fact that the Philippines is a long-time defense ally. So this is something that the Philippine government officials should take, usually take note uh, when they engage China in the, in the area of, of maritime cooperation, especially. Uh, it is a long-time defense ally of the US and faces now, now at, while we speak or as we speak, Increasing, increasing pressure from the US for its ascendant security objectives. And this was uh, underlined during the recent visits of uh, US uh, State uh, Secretary Anthony Blinken and also the, uh, the, the recent visit of, a, of a, an American Senate delegation uh, who, that met with uh, President Marcos and also other uh, government officials. And now, uh, aside from this, uh, uh, there is a maritime security cooperation ongoing between the Philippines and the US. On the other hand, uh, there's uh, a um, quite, uh, well, shall we say debatable statement coming from National Security Advisor Clarita Carlos, uh, who said recently, China is our partner and friend America is also our friend, and we cannot choose either or, or it doesn't work that way. Our interest is to gain whatever benefits we can from our relations with China and uh, with the US. Uh, this is uh, one indication, indication that uh, causes one to think whether the Marcos Jr. government is really intent on uh, developing an independent foreign policy or is it a balancing balancing kind of foreign policy in the sense that uh, well you cannot really uh, develop an independent foreign policy unless of course you get rid of the uh, the military base u.s military bases and various defense agreements with the u.s so how can you pursue an independent foreign policy Finally, the U.S. strategy against China goes beyond Asia. It, is, uh, it originates from baseless fears about China's rise. And uh, this is the universal truth today. 
shared by many experts, political analysts all over the world, the U.S. aims to preserve its glo global hegemony. And if that means engaging in, pro in provocative wars with China, then so be it. Finally, my final word, in the coming years, probably even decades, uh, Asia and the whole world will be um, challenged by prolonged tensions and conflicts instigated by the US. Uh, especially because now that uh, the American economy has weakened and the only economy that uh, props up the American system is the war economy uh, that is uh, uh, championed by uh, the powerful military industrial complex and so on and so forth. And one of the examples of this uh, the tensions instigated by the US today is the ongoing tension in the Taiwan Strait. On the other hand, I'd like to say that cooperation with the, between the Philippines and China should prevail because it is in the best interest of both countries. On the other hand, state to state or government to government cooperation should be complemented by more people to people exchanges think tank dialogues. I have always uh, uh, expressed an opinion to uh, some Chinese colleagues and friends that yes, uh, to maintain government cooperation or state to state cooperation. But you know, in the case of the Philippines, governments cannot come and go, presidents come and go. So for instance, uh, one president like Duterte may have a different policy. The next president, Marcos Jr. may have a different policy. So there's no consistency and even a, uh, a strategy, a long-term strategy with respect to the foreign policy of the Philippines. And the only avenue I think that I will guarantee long-term cooperation is the avenue of people-to-people -people exchanges and think tank dialogues. In the meantime, in the Philippines today, there are internal struggles to review defense treaties with the US toward their abrog abrogation. So the struggles uh, are continuing. There, there, is, uh, there are movements uh, to review uh, the defense treaties with, with the US. And there has been a long time clamor already for the abrogation of these defense treaties, precisely because these de defense treaties uh, continue to lock, to trap the Philippines into some kind of a war, war scenario. Uh, where the Philippines is under obligation to support the American side. And uh, that means uh, that will be a threat to the Philippine foreign policy because it is unable to develop more friends and it continues to, uh, to confront enemies, supposed enemies that are actually the enemies of the United States. So that is my political uh, my a political perspective on the maritime, on the cooperation between China and the Philippines. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bobby Tawasan of Senpeg for um, expanding the discussion of the, our topic for today on um, the protection of marine environment, for fishery management, and maritime law enforcement, and giving us a perspective as to the political side of these issues. And even I think Professor Bobby extended it to, in, to, to, to explain further that, you know, when you talk about maritime cooperation between the Philippines and China, geopolitics comes in, and it's actually important. And sometimes external pressure coming from the likes of the United States, you know, muddled or some in many ways or most often than that complicates matter 
uh, and, and um, even the you know the, the the relationship between the two countries, especially when you talk about maritime cooperation. Now, precisely because um, as we understand, the U.S. has interest in the region, and we have seen it through the presence of different um, groups like AUKUS, Quad, and even its Indo-Pacific strategy is in its under implementation at the moment. So. I also would like to point out, and I also would like to share, uh, point out that I share the same sentiment with Professor Bobby Tuason that in, in our side, in the Philippines, there's no such thing as consistency when you talk about foreign policy. Foreign policy changes depends on who is in Malacanang or who is the president. No? And we still have this challenge of crafting a long-term strategy when you talk about how the Philippines will navigate the geopolitical situation at the same time when you talk about um, foreign policy. Because that's why I share the same sentiment that people-to-people -people engagement and you know, discussion between different think tanks from both sides are very important precisely because of this uh, Philippine, these challenges that as a country we're facing at the moment. So um, those are my takeaways from the presentation of Professor Bobby Tuazon. Um, Mr. Daipan, do you have any comment before yeah, yeah. we proceed to the introduction of the fourth speaker, which will you will be the one introducing? Okay, thank you. So uh, Professor tu Bobby Tuazon here has uh, research about uh, Philippine channel cooperation during big power competition times. So many Chinese uh, scholars are uh, uh, also pay special attention to this topic because we are also wondering if the BBM administration will continue its past friend policy toward China. Um, Professor uh, Trazon talked about some cases like uh, the Philippines one China policy and also maritime dialogue between other countries and uh, even Professor Carlos comments on Philippines foreign policy toward China and the uh, United States. Uh, anyway, and I to be honest, I uh, many Chinese people like me are also worrying about the possible American influence on China-Philippine relations because no people can deny the United States influence and uh, and their ambition of the Philippines. So I'm I, I'm not so to be honest, I'm not so positive about the future because I don't know um, how American will try to influence um, the Philippines and I don't know if the Philippines can follow its past friend policy toward China. So hopefully um, some scholar here can give us your comments later. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Professor um, Daifan, before you proceed, I just want also to make um, um, an intervention that one more thing that I think is very important in the presentation of Professor Bobby Tuazon is the fact that he said that a possible area of cooperation between China and the Philippines on fishery management and scientific engagement on, on this issue is very important. I, I think I believe I believe this is important that I hope that both countries will be able to you know to talk about and probably form some kind of bilateral dialogue on this because I believe that the more cooperation we have from both sides, even in fishery management, I think the more that understanding will be bridged because people are talking even at this low level politics. Because when you talk about sovereignty issues, these are high level politics. But when you talk about fishery management, you know, and joint cooperation in the South China Sea, these are low politics that are very important and I hope it will happen anytime soon. So yes, proceed. Yeah, so I, I, I totally agree with you. So this is why the next speaker. <laughs>